Hello comrades, this is the Finnish Bolshevik, and this time I am interviewing a Lithuanian comrade of mine. Hello comrades. If you could talk about the current status of the communist movement in Lithuania and the um, past few years or um, what change there has been and what uh, the government does to suppress communism and all those types of things. Well, let's start from the fact that in our country, which calls itself a democracy with so-called free speech, human rights, etc., the Communist Party of Lithuania is prohibited. And it is a similar situation in Latvia and Estonia. And the justification for this policy is a very, how to say, a typical cliché of Eastern European states that supposedly this theory of totalitarianism, that Nazism and communism are the same thing, both are evil, both are equal, and we must condemn both of them, therefore, a little less than 10 years ago, the parliament passed a legal act which prohibits demonstrating not only Nazi swastikas, but also hammers and sickles, red stars, etc., in a public area because it is so-called totalitarian uh, symbolism. So you cannot openly go outside with a hammer and sickle on your chest on a t-shirt and say, oh, I'm a communist. You will, you will probably get arrested and have to pay a fine. However, it is of course possible to maneuver on the edge of the law by promoting essentially socialist, communist, Marxist ideology, but without using the most explicit sim. Mm -hmm. And as regards this, the Marxist movement in our country, it's in a very difficult situation, because if we look in the early 90s, when the Communist Party was prohibited, part of it remained underground, but uh, the other group, of uh, Marxists founded the Socialist Party of Lithuania. The Socialist Party of Lithuania became legally registered as a political party, and uh, its goal was to preserve the Marxist ideological legacy here. Sadly, the young generation here is either apolitical, many people emigrate to Western countries in search of better paid jobs, uh, and those who stay here and uh, among the minority who are not indifferent and are searching for some kind of real or alleged alternative, most of them go into this bourgeois nationalism like, you know, like in Ukraine, Bandera, or mm -hmm. so-called alt-right, and, uh, no, and so on and so on. This is the trend, the fashion. And... Uh, in the recent decade, the representative of uh, socialist Marxist ideology in Lithuania on the political level was a political party called Socialist People's Front uh, that uh, essentially was the successor to the Socialist Party of Lithuania. However, as a result of both serious uh, political mistakes and infiltrated opportunists and revisionists inside the organization, the party has recently underwent a split. If we want to talk about a so-called uh, communist or socialist movement, we must understand that it does not exist in a vacuum. For there to be such a movement, there should be a mass of working people who would want to fight for their economic interests. So this implies the trade union movement. However, in our country. The trade union movement has been in horrible decline, very passive, and many people actually don't even trust the trade unions anymore. So sometimes it seems like a dead end when you just lack the contact with uh, labor organizations which don't really exist and don't mm -hmm. operate now. Who controls the trade unions or do the trade unions just not do anything? The trade unions are controlled by a central 
a confederation of trade unions, and it of course is controlled by the state, by the government, because he who feeds it, he controls it. So who feeds them? Who pays them the money? The government pays them the money. So they, the leaders of trade, the big leaders of trade unions, are in league with social democratic party. Social democratic party is party of who are so-called red bourgeois. Social Democratic Party supports the capitalism, supports actually even neoliberal economic reforms, and ordinary people in these trade unions very often just don't uh, trust, uh, don't trust this uh, organizations anymore. And the problem is that many who see the situation, they just decide to, well, why should I stay here and try to fight? I buy Ryanair ticket, I go to England or Ireland to work there, or Germany, I believe I will get a better life there, and they just leave. In this country, it's very much the same thing. The trade unions are all controlled by, I would say, like 80% are of the seats in the, um, whatever you call the board of directors of the trade unions, they are social democrats and the rest of them are left liberals but there is a trade union opposition it's pretty small but we're trying to create an opposition is there any kind of trade union opposition in lithuania as i know there are pockets of people who are dissatisfied and want to do something independently and we do have some people some comrades who are communicating with them and hopefully hopefully i really sincerely hope that something will materialize. I believe if there was at least one or two or three successful strikes, successful actions, which would achieve a practical economic betterment for these people, then maybe the, the trade union idea, the trade union movement could be, at least to an extent, revitalized and people would start to believe in it again. But at the moment, uh, it's a very difficult situation and I believe that the only perspective thing for us, things which we can do here, is number one, to try to build the contacts with these dissatisfied trade unionists and try to make an opposition, as you call it, an alternative uh, segment in trade union movement, number one. And number two, uh, what must be done is a promotion, propaganda of Marxism, Leninism among people, especially among the younger generation, because in spite of the emigration, in spite of the social apathy, there still is a segment of people who are dissatisfied and who are looking for an alternative, only they are looking for it, or we could say they are finding it in the wrong places. So I think it is our task to provide them with the information that they would come towards a Marxist uh, conclusions. What about the state suppression of uh, communists? What exactly does the state do? Immediately when uh, the counter-revolution happened in the early 90s, those who actually remained loyal to their communist beliefs and wanted to defend what was the Soviet uh, Republic of Lithuania, these people were made into enemies of the state, into criminals, and after being arrested, show trials, kangaroo court sentenced them to long jail sentences. The most famous among these people will be Nikolas Burokevichus, Yuzas Yarmalavichus, and Yuzas Kolelis. Burokevichus was the figurehead, is already deceased. Since 2016, Kolelis resides at his home in Vilnius, and uh, Yarmolavich lives as a political emigrant, we could say so, in Russia. These were the first, we could say, and most notable political prisoners in this country. And after this, uh, simply there was a regime of intimidation and terror to make everyone uh, be afraid to express such beliefs. And uh, if we want to go to today's situation, to contemporary situation, we can talk not only about communists, but generally about uh, what we could call as uh, radical opposition groups, which are very different ideologically, but have the common points of being against EU, being against NATO, and neoliberal economics. So, what is the situation with this? 
among this uh, segment, uh, the so-called radical opposition, of course, there are people with a Marxist, uh, with a communist agenda. So, during the past years, especially after the so-called uh, colored revolution in Ukraine, known as Maidan, there has been uh, an intensification of anti-Russian, Russophobic uh, propaganda in our terms. This line that we are part of the West, Russia and Putin are attacking us everywhere and every day and all the time, and what we need for the safety is more military spending. It's exactly identical here as, as well, and like, you are already a member of NATO, right? In our context, they're heavily trying to push us to join NATO, but you already are in NATO. As being part of the NATO, we are fed that we need more uh, bases, military bases here. And it is very funny that uh, in the bourgeois constitution passed in 1992, Lithuanian bourgeois republic's constitution, it is explicitly stated in the 137th uh, paragraph that there cannot be in the territory of Republic of Lithuania either weapons of mass destruction or foreign military bases. However, the Constitutional Court has made a decision that NATO is uh, not a foreign forces, NATO is an international alliance of which we are a part of, so their bases here do not constitute a foreign uh, military oh, base. Wow. <laughs> well, but we have these bases, and the number of troops and tanks and um, aircrafts are being increased year after year with the uh, rotation of Belgian, German, American, etc. troops here. And the government is cracking down on anyone who says that we don't need this, who says that we don't need uh, to arm ourselves against Russia, because the enemy of the people is not in Russia, the enemy of the people are those who created such a social and economic catastrophe that over one million Lithuanians had to emigrate to the West over the past decades. Now, what happens to this, what I refer to as radical opposition? We had demonstrations against NATO bases in Lithuania, we had leaflets denouncing uh, NATO occupation in the country, and uh, as a result of this, the government said that these are underground pro-Russian extremist groups who must be dealt with. As a result of this, many people were subjected to house searches. They had their stuff, computers, papers, books, etc., etc., taken away from them. And the big media showed that, oh, we have found, we have found the enemies of the state who are working for Putin. And this court case, or we could call this judicial farce, is continuing already, I believe, for about two years. And now, several individuals are on trial for supposedly anti-constitutional activities. And just think of the irony that their argument against NATO bases in Lithuania is based on the Constitution of 1992, which the government claims to be defending. And yet, this very same government, which approves of foreign troops in the country, which is anti-constitutional, accuses these people of anti-constitutional activity. So, this is the insanity here. Absolute insanity this anti-constitutional activity that they speak of, it basically, what does it mean? Demonstrating against NATO and uh, giving leaflets? Yes, essentially that. And uh, they try to implicate that, oh, maybe there is financing from Russia, maybe there are weapons, maybe there are explosive substances. Of course, they have not discovered anything of the sort during the raids. But there's a very funny quote attributed to Hegel. If the facts contradict my theory, then the worse is for the facts. So here it is the same. If facts contradict their accusations, then let's throw the facts into the rubbish and let's continue the accusations. Yeah. That's how it is. 
would you say it's practically illegal or is it practically very difficult to oppose NATO then? It is uh, on the border of legal and illegal. You, you, can, you can do it, but you must have, uh, how to say, you must have balls to do it because the intimidation on television, on radio, on internet, it's very extreme. Just imagine that the day after the, uh, there was a picket in front of the uh, American embassy against NATO, the media portrayed that, oh, these are almost some criminals who are working against Lithuania, who are hired by the Russia, and we are going to crack down on them. This was the discourse. So, of course, uh, normal people will be watching this on TV. They will feel scared. Oh, I don't want police to come to my house. I don't want court case against me, so I won't do anything. And uh, actually, this uh, state of psychological terror, this state of intimidation, has affected massively not only the question of NATO, but generally the whole political atmosphere here. Because if you observe the last nine, ten years, the political activity of uh, masses of people has sharply declined. And I believe this has to do not only with, of course, huge uh, amount of emigration, but it also has to do with the notion of protesting, the notion of going into the streets and expressing your opinion against the present situation. This is demonized. This is vilified. You are portrayed either as a criminal or as some kind of psychopath or loser, you know. This is the public discourse we have. Yeah, I think you said that the government calls these uh, smaller uh, opposition parties uh, marginals or something. Oh, yes. To me, that is the most totalitarian thing I've ever heard, that uh, we should just get rid of these marginals who are disrupting the normal uh, order of whatever <laughs> but that's exactly like that's exactly what what is the discourse here and they repeat it over and over and over and over again that you really can start feeling as a marginal here how does this uh, legal action against so-called pro-russian extremism look in this country i can say it from the perspective as i saw it in real life one morning, you are minding your own business, and there's a ring on the door. And uh, s several persons are standing there. They say, we are from the police commissariat. We have arrived to s search your place for some stuff. Well, so I say, okay, guys, let's, let's do this quickly, get it over with. And you are then given uh, a text, which is the court order for a house search, and this court order describes what are the potential crimes that have been committed. Among them is the allegation of propaganda work against the Republic of Lithuania, financially supported by the Russian Federation, promoting extremism, potentially, potentially promoting terrorism, and attempting to undermine the constitutional order the sovereignty and or the territorial integrity of the Republic of Lithuania, and promoting supposedly ideas of the pro prohibited communist Bolshevik party. Though on those leaflets there was nothing that incited to violence, it was even explicitly written non-violent, and there was nothing explicitly Bolshevik there. But uh, that's how they interpreted it. So, when I heard such suspicions, it was really funny, because it's absolutely absurd. Well, so what happened then? They go, they look through your stuff, they take the computer, and bye-bye, you know. But some other people had it more serious, like uh, other people had the, their, some books confiscated, their papers confiscated, and uh, the worst is when you don't have a platform on the mainstream media, but the mainstream media demonizes you and presents it as a, no, as a boogeyman, that, oh, these Putinists, Kremlins have been unmasked, and now there will be legal action against them because we cannot tolerate these actions against our great country. It's some kind of petty 
local McCarthyism, where if you don't agree with the general line of the government, you are a Vatican. That means you are working for Russia, you are working for Putin, etc. And you don't even have to be a communist for that. And you don't even have to uh, be necessarily even against NATO for that. It is sufficient to criticize the government and European Union. I will tell you, one of the most absurd occurrences was when there was in 2015, the autumn of 2015, there was a strike. A strike of teachers demanding better salaries paid to them. And you know what the media says, what the, what the government said to the media. What was the official line? Behind the teacher's strike is the hand of the Kremlin. The, I, I'm serious. This was spoken on mainstream media. These teachers, they didn't even raise any political issues whatsoever. It was a purely economic strike. And even behind this, the hand of the Kremlin is to be found. This is more than just a political persecution against communists or against anti-imperialists or other activists. This is this is a kind of schizophrenia. Some of our comrades have a good uh, term for it. It is Russophrenia. Russophrenia. It's not as bad as it could be. We have not yet been burned alive as in Odessa by these glorious patriots. And uh, I will tell you another interesting detail. You know what I'm talking about, the murder in Odessa. Yeah. So, just think about it. A mainstream Lithuanian politician, member of the Liberal Party, Patras Ostravichus, is for European Union, for Western liberal democracy, for the human rights, etc., etc., etc. And when the people were burned alive in Odessa, he openly glorified it. He said, this is good. We are destroying uh, Vatniks. We are destroying scum. We are defending the state. And this is a good example to follow. So, it's in Lithuania, we don't have it as bad as in Ukraine. We are not burnt alive. But we have people, not only on this neo-Nazi and uh, nationalist so-called so -called patriot camp, but we have liberals promoting the murder of people because they don't agree with their opinions. And guess what? If you criticize the NATO, you get a court case against you. Uh, this liberal glorified those who murdered civilians in Odessa. It's normal. He doesn't have any criminal investigation, nothing. No hate speech, nothing. It's, it's normal. And these are the true values of the imperialist NATO, of the imperialist European Union, and the so-called democracy we have. What about the uh, protest movement? You told me that there's been a big change. Um, you said that there used to be bigger demonstrations, but after government crackdowns, they've uh, yeah. sort of stopped. In 2008, as you know very well, began the so-called global financial crisis. Everywhere began the introduction of austerity measures. Same was in Lithuania, where there was elected at the end of 2008 a conservative government. They introduced severe austerity measures, of course directed not against the big business, not against bourgeois, but against ordinary people. Many lost their jobs, many were kicked out from their apartments, and they had no, how to say, <laughs> they had nowhere to go. They had nothing to do. Only run away or try to demand their basic human rights. As a result of this, there was a massive demonstration with trade unions and various parties from the whole political spectrum, of course, except the mainstream parties. When I say whole political spectrum, I mean from anarchists to socialists to, to even nationalists and skinheads, very, very, very wide. There was this huge demonstration with thousands and thousands of people in front of the parliament building. It was in the beginning of 2009. And people during this demonstration started to throw uh, snowballs at the parliament building. The government infiltrated into the ranks of the demonstrators provocateurs who were used to start a physical confrontation. And as a result of this, they brought in the 
public security services, you know, with the shields, with the uh, bat arms, with the uh, tear gas, and so on, and so on, and so on. And there was a quite brutal action against these demonstrators. I myself, say, I was quite young then, but I was there too, and I saw it. People were covered in blood. Their limbs were penetrated with rubber bullets, and no, it was a horrible, horrible scene. And after this, there was a criminal procedure against people who participated in this demonstration, and about a hundred, if not more, were sentenced for inciting and participating in riots. The media, at the same time, promoted the notion that these are drug addicts, these are criminals, these are this low-life scum who go against our great government, which we love so much and which is so great, and that if you go to protest against government, you're just a scumbag. And this notion of being a scumbag and being a laughing stock of the society for going to protest, it started to sink in into the psyche of the mass. And if you look in the years from 2010 to 2013-14, the numbers of public demonstrations gradually decrease and decrease from thousands and hundreds to maybe a few hundreds and then just tens of people. For example, I remember how in 2016, mainstream trade unions wanted to make a demonstration on the International Workers' Day. There was maybe 50 people at most. It's mainstream. It's not the communist, uh, radical, extremist, whatever. Mainstream. They were not even able to gather so many people. Shows t total apathy in the society. And if we want to look what could have been objective causes, there is a very, very natural explanation that each year, literally tens of thousands, 30, sometimes 40,000 people, they emigrate from Lithuania to West in search of better jobs because the unemployment rate here, which is now below, it is below 10%, but it is artificially kept down because those who don't have a job who don't have a normal livelihood, they just evacuate, they run away. Mm -hmm. And the mass of people went away from here, so of course, there will not be a big mass to go to these demonstrations. And especially we must have in mind that over 50% of the emigrants are 30 years of age and below. So it is youth who emigrate the most. This is of course the objective circumstance why the political scene has become so apathetic and passive in the past years. However, the government, which is under the influence of our present uh, president, Dalia Grybauskaite, has uh, also quite a lot to do with it. Anyone who goes against this liberal conservative status quo is essentially pushed into the margins and annihilated. Essentially, we have this pseudo-democracy with some fascist characteristics and a massive emigration from the country which preserves the status quo. How many people would you say emigrate? Ooh, the population the, is falling, right? It is dramatically falling, but, uh, well, let's look at it this way. About one million have emigrated the 90s, when counter-revolution was happening. There was well over 3.6 million people. So we have lost so much. As regards to the trends of emigration, I am very sad to say that when there are surveys done of young people, students, even senior, uh, senior classes of the high school, many, 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 50% maybe, they, 50 or more than 50%, they consider emigration, if not as what they plan to do, then at least as an option. Wow. It's a sinking ship that is being evacuated. Mm -hmm. And a uh, very interesting detail is that even uh, mainstream bourgeois professors, academics, sociologists, admit that if not for the massive, massive emigration from the country, 
we would probably be facing a social explosion, social unrest, conflict, protest, etc., etc. So I believe that the massive emigration is part of a strategy of the ruling class here to pacify the population, and it is also my belief that uh, this is a typical, very typical trend of general, generally these Eastern European post-Soviet countries. Mm. It's, it's the same. Look at look at Ukraine after Maidan, when they signed the cooperation with EU. How many emigrated? Actually, some of them emigrate to Lithuania in the hope of getting good so-called European salaries. But what happens? These people have their personal ID taken away from them. They work for as a sort of slaves in construction projects. And at best, they get paid maybe one-third of what an ordinary Lithuanian worker would get paid for the same job. Just think about the hypocrisy. They say, oh, our brothers in Ukraine, we must support. So th this is the brotherhood. It's brotherhood of Lithuanian and Ukrainian capitalists to just uh, screw over the ordinary working people. To top this off, recently there was an interesting scandal here that there were several tens of workers from Nepal who immigrated to Lithuania. Some of them were literally made into slaves of sex traffic. <laughs> this is the kind of society that they are running here. They kick out our own people who cannot find a job here, and then they import immigrants, and they make these immigrants into slaves, and they call this a brotherhood with Ukraine, and uh, etc., and etc., this is consistent with the uh, European Union's policy because, you know, in the EU they demand that it's an absolute right that you be allowed to transport as much money as you want from country to country and transport as many people. There has to be a free movement of labor. It functions as a um, big reserve army of labor for these massive multinational corporations. Exactly. And the extent uh, to which it, uh, how to say, divides and rules these people, how it atomizes uh, the working people, it is, it is something terrible. I also wanted to ask you something about the um, specific measures against the socialist um, movement and the communist movement. You know something about the, the socialist people's front, so you were telling me how in order to be registered as a party, you have to do certain things, and you, you said that you even have to pay money to be accepted as a party. The law for uh, political parties here has been changed. Previously, it demanded 1,000 members for a party to be legally registered. Now the number was raised to 2,000. And by members to be legally registered, I will specify what I mean. It means that you need 2,000 individuals who will fill a form. On this form, they will show their name, their surname, their passport number, personal ID code, etc. All of all this, where they live, all details, all personal details, like in a government archive. And the record, the collection of all these personal forms must be given to the government. The Ministry of Justice must have all of these individuals who belong to this and that party. It, you understand? Yeah. This uh, is how it is here for years and years. But they, well, the only new thing is that they introduced a larger number of people from 1,000 to 2,000, which you must have for a legal party to persist. Now, what is the problem? Of course, uh, the problem was before that it's not very realistic here to have 1,000 real or 2,000 active real members in the present condition. This, of course, creates very excellent, perfect conditions for government agencies to infiltrate inside and uh, influence uh, political parties. And, of course, it, uh, it creates a problem of gathering the signatures. And uh, the Socialist People's Front had only about 1,200 or 1,300 approximately members on the paper, and it was unable to gather 2,000, 
as a result of this, it, uh, among with several other, many other <laughs> so-called marginal parties, is uh, under the is subjected to a process of legal dissolution. And now the part uh, of uh, Socialist People's Front who remain loyal to socialist and Marxist principles will probably register themselves not as a party but as a social movement and continue activities like that. However, as far as money is concerned, you need money to participate in elections. If you do not present a specific lump sum to participate either in parliamentary elections, local municipality elections, or European Parliament elections, for example, hypothetically, for presidential elections, you will not be allowed to participate. You must pay a money. Uh, and the sum of money, of course, is such that either you must have a significant uh, number of ordinary people who will support you, big number, it, it is possible, but different. Or you must have a rich donor. Of course, most often it is the Latin. After the counter-revolution of the 90s, what has changed? Was healthcare privatized? Um, both yes and no. Uh, the institution of public health care has been preserved. However, for many and many um, actions there, you must pay mm -hmm. money. It has become extremely corrupt. And there have been a rise in so-called private clinics, which are privatized. But uh, these private clinics suggest, how to say, very specific uh, health care services. And in this specific sphere, most often high quality one, but they are very expensive and affordable only to uh, the rich segment of the population. And uh, generally... On a piece of paper, you have uh, free health care guaranteed to you, but in reality, operations and uh, basic things which you need, you must always pay money for it, and the decline has been significant. Trust in the system is not, people are not very trusting. I find it pretty funny. People also say that uh, Finland has free universal health care, and it's pretty mysterious because it's, it's not free. Arguably, it's pretty cheap, but you gotta pay for all the procedures. You gotta pay. You gotta like, especially for the medicine, you have to pay lots of money. But is the healthcare in Lithuania is it cheap or is it expensive? It's very expensive. Some old people, for example, most of their pensions are dedicated to buying medical products at extortionate prices. Mm -hmm. And who takes the money? The the, the pharmaceutical companies take all the money. What about uh, education? Is education public or private or both? Education is mostly public, and the order is such. You have obligatory education of 10 years, which is the basic education. You can finish 12 years and get the middle education, and uh, either professional education in a so-called prof-tech, or uh, university, you can, you can also go to both. Um, and uh, the order with university education, generally with high education universities, colleges, etc., is such that uh, there is a contest, a competition, according to the marks which you receive in school. And if you do well, then it is likely that you will get a state-sponsored place. However, this does depend on the specific study program which you applied. Some, for example, humanitarian studies, it is more likely to uh, receive a state-sponsored uh, place, whereas in um, technical, uh, for example, or uh, medicine, for example, it is very difficult to get state-sponsored place, and if you do not, it it is quite expensive. But generally, we could say there still is state-sponsored education. Hmm. Private uh, niche is quite small. There are several private schools, but they definitely do not constitute the majority. Again, they, they only, like the private clinics, they only appropriate the so-called elite. How do you see the future? Is the austerity still going on? 
The austerity is definitely going on, however, it is directed mostly at ordinary people because, for example, this month the Prime Minister issued a statement. He will decrease taxation for those who have more than 6,000 euro income per month. So for these people, taxation will be less. Everyone else must pay as they used to pay. Mm, wow. So, it's just an example of who this government serves. Anyway, I think austerity will continue here. The poverty statistic, which is that about 30% of people are on or below the poverty line, it will escalate. The only stabilizing factor will be the emigration, but on the other hand, the emigration is making this place into an economic wasteland that is alive only thanks to outside financial injections. And uh, in 2012, a significant part of these injections, specifically EU funds, will be stopped. And EU funds constitute quite a significant part of the national budget. So I believe that after 2012, uh, sorry, after 2020, the situation may escalate. However, if emigration will continue, then the whole potential for this will will just be eroded. But my dream would be for the European Union to start collapsing and the borders to start closing. If this happened, then we would actually have we would have some good prospects, I think. But generally. If we take the status quo and we assume that it will not dramatically change in the coming decade or so, I think there will be just a gradual economic and demographic decline, coupled with a political, cultural, and moral decline. I could even say total degradation of the society. That's what's happening. Surely this emigration cannot continue like indefinitely, otherwise there's going to be nobody left if the population exactly, just falls. Exactly, exactly. But that's what it's going to. That's the problem. Children and old people remain, others run away. And the statistics uh, actually present a more optimistic than is in reality uh, view. Like, they don't show how totally screwed up it is. And even what they show is already quite screwed up. My only hope is that in the coming uh, years, the escalation of social problems will force a part of people to think and actually realize that the system is rigged, that the system is directed against them, and maybe, just maybe, some of them will start to wake up and do something. I really hope. But, you know, as uh, there's the saying of Antonio Gramsci, be pessimist of the mind, but optimist of the will. So, you know, I, I agree with it. So, anything else you would like to talk about, or any closing statements? There is just one fundamental problem which many people miss, both Marxist as well as uh, anti-communist propagandists. If you open the very beginning of the Communist Manifesto, it says clearly that the class struggle ends either in the revolutionary overthrow of the whole society, or it ends with the collapse of the whole society and the downfall of all struggling classes. In other words, in the total chaos, the total collapse of the civilization, as was when the Roman Empire fell. And what I fear concerning uh, Europe would be exactly such a fate. And I believe here the slogan that it is either socialism or barbarism is very actual. Our task is to spread this message, because really, either we change the system or, or you know what's waiting for us. <laughs> so this is more or less what I had to say in answer to our comrades' questions, and I do sincerely hope that listening to this was not so boring, well, and that we will continue to communicate, and that in spite of the adverse circumstances that Communists in this region, in this part of the world, will not lose their hope, will not lose faith, and will continue doing their work, because it is important, it is necessary, and if we do not succeed in the end, then, well, just look at what's happening in Ukraine. This is our future. I believe for 
mentally sane people, this is not a very attractive future. So let's try to avoid it. Parks after dark by candlelight.